Oh man, that trip to Jamaica was like the most, it's, it's the most mind blowing journey of my entire life. Malice in Gangeland. You've got to understand, I'd never been to the island. Mm. Um, you know, the closest I'd ever been was seeing this film, A Harder They Come. And as you so rightly pointed out, I was invited by John to escape the kind of implosion of the um, pistols and help Richard Branson start a reggae label. You know, cut to, you know, me sitting by the pool in Kingston, Jamaica, and it's like, you know, the jungle drums have gone out in a rich white man signing up reggae <laughs> artists. Because for the next two weeks, everybody who was anybody except Bob Marley, Bunny Whaler and Peter Tosh, came to try and get a deal with Richard. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting by the pool and I'm seeing all these names that I've previously only seen on, you know, record labels, you know, all my childhood heroes. So, you know, I owe John big time for that, you know. Yeah. Well, Rebel Dread is out in cinemas and on digital this Friday, the 4th of March. And right now, Don Letts, welcome to the programme. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks so much, so much for being on. Look, we'll, 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 get to, we'll get to punk and the punk spirit in a moment, but let's talk a little bit about your early life first, right? You, um, right. you, you, you talk in, in the film about growing up in London as a sort of first-generation British with Jamaican parents, and you talk about an early childhood uh, in, in South London, in Brixton, where people got along, but how that all changed overnight with Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech in 1968. Was it really that abrupt? Absolutely. I mean, I left to our own devices this bunch of misfits kind of work things out because we realized better or worse we we're in this thing together and then the politicians come in with that age old trick which we've seen rolled out time and time again that sort of divide and rule thing and it kind of polarized the landscape I mean before Enoch made that speech you know I was hanging out with my white mates after you know the next very next day it was like you know go back to your own country you know that mm. kind of stuff to really, really that really that abrupt yeah absolutely but you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and the same year he made that speech you know james brown released the song say it loud i'm black and i'm proud and that's what i rolled with <laughs> tell, tell me what well, look moving on a little bit from that tell me about the day you saw the who in a london pub and what impact that had on you oh absolutely life-changing you gotta understand i'm as old as rock and roll you know and um, i'm a product of kind of the vinyl generation you know, that, back in those days, that was their only source of alternative information and inspiration. Anyway, I'm at school one day, rumour goes around the school, some band wants to see, um, wants an audience, they're going to play. So I leave school in my uniform to go and see some band do their thing. And I walk in to see The Who, doing what you call a full production rehearsal. So they're not just jamming. You know, there's the dry ice, there's the lasers, Townsend's doing his windmill. And I'm like 15 feet from the stage. I can see the whites of Keith Moon's eyes, man. And that was it, changed my life overnight because I just knew I wanted more of whatever was unfolding in front of my eyes. Didn't necessarily want to be in a band or being a singer. I just wanted more of that energy. And I stepped through that door boldly. I mean, so that's something that comes across really, really strongly in the film. It's just that it's the lure of the lure of a scene of wanting to be part of a scene of being associated with a scene, knowing that there's this sort of world that you really want to be a part of. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a great believer that every generation needs its own soundtrack. And I'm of that age where I grew up with some fantastic music. I had reggae coming in this year, but in the other ear, it's the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, the Who. And uh, it kind of reflected the duality of what I am, which is black and British. Mm. T t tell me about the shop you ran on the King's Road, Acme Attractions, which a lot of the sort of early, um, well, I was going to say early punk pioneers vis visited, but also, of course, so did Bob Marley and Rod Stewart and all sorts of people visited there. T t tell, tell me about the place. OK, I think, I think you've got to put in a bit of context because in the mid-70s, times were kind of dread. There weren't a lot of places for people like myself, you know, sort of outsiders, to hang out. There weren't no clubs, really. The popular of the music popular music of the time was a million miles from the street. So what happened is you had these sort of disaffected youth wandering up and down the King's Road, which is where I had Acme Attractions. And they'd hang out in one of two shops, either my shop or Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood shop, Sex, which was like, I don't know, 500 yards further mm. down the road. But um, I guess I had more people in my shop because I had a better soundtrack. <laughs> And pe people would come to the shop just to hang out, to be seen, to meet each other, rather than just, I mean, did they buy stuff too? Absolutely. I mean, we were selling, selling sort of retro clothes and zoot suits and pig, pink peg, tre peg trousers and jelly sandals and things like that. And, um, you know, in between like buying bits and pieces, there was this kind of, I don't know, creative exchange going on. All these like-minded people were 
put into a space. And out of that mix came this kind of, you know, the beginnings of punk rock, it has to be said, because that shop opened in like 75 and punk really exploded in 76, 77. Yeah, yeah, so it come, comes directly on. You look, I mean, getting to know all those sort of, all the punk pioneers, the Sex Pistols, Malcolm McLaren, Vivian Westwood, people like that, before, I mean, who, people who were, who were basically about to change the face of British culture shortly before they did. What, what were they like pre-fame? How different was it? Well, you've got to understand, when I met these characters, you know, The Clash and Johnny Rotten, as he was known then, they weren't the kind of larger-than-life characters that you now know. We were just young teenagers trying to do our thing, express ourselves, and earn a crust, it has to be said. And we were thrown together by the kind of politics and the economics of the, you know, of the country at that time, because it was dread back in you know, the mid, mid mm. to late 70s. I mean, lucky for me, I had a soundtrack to ease my pain. I had reggae, but my white mates, not so lucky. So they set about creating a soundtrack that I guess was sort of of the people, for the people, by the people. We're talking about punk rock. Mm. Well, I mean, you, you make the case very strongly in the film that um, the, the links between reggae and, 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 and punk rock, almost, almost to the extent of the one the one coming coming out of the other. I mean, and, and uh, you know, that's some, uh, that sometimes today seems to be a link that's sort of largely forgotten. Well, I mean, sonically, they're miles apart. Of course, yeah. You know, but I mean, what they had in common was a kind of, um, you know, we were, it was created by like-minded rebels, outsiders. And the way that the music was actually created was the fact that, you know, a lot of these people couldn't play their instruments, so they help, could hold down a chord and strum a guitar. And that's why those early songs are so fast and furious. And in Jamaica, they could do all the fancy Eric Clapton bits, thank <laughs> God. And, uh, you know, but they could hold a chord and, you know, do the skank. Do you know what I mean? And they sort of turned what would have been a problem into an asset. And that's very much a punk rock attitude. Mm, sure. You, you knew, I mean, on, on reggae, you knew Bob Marley when he was in London. Um, tell us a bit about him. There's a, there's a great bit in the film where you talk about turning up at his place in sort of punk bondage trousers and he doesn't approve. OK, here's another spoiler for you, folks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> God. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I was lucky enough to meet Bob Marley and become an acquaintance. I mean, over the years, that's translated on the internet Don Bob you know Don Letts was Bob Marley's friend no I was one of his acquaintances and he had many in London but um the last time yeah we met up I went around there to get some money he owed me surprise surprise and I was wearing bondage trousers and he'd got a very negative idea of what punk was about because he'd been reading the tabloid press and he basically looked at me and said Don Letts you look like a nasty punk rocker get out of here and I <laughs> stood my ground I said Bob, you got it wrong. You know, these are my friends. You know, they're like-minded rebels, to which he basically laughed and kicked me out. <laughs> anyway, three months later, a somewhat better informed Bob Marley was moved to write that song, Punky Reggae Party. So, uh, you know, in my books, I got the last laugh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, 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 like, it sounds like you brought him round. Um, you say, look, I, I don't think it's a spoiler, but I should say it anyway. Uh, you say in the film that the Sex Pistols broke punk, but the Clash gave it meaning. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, you know, I think it was... What was his name? Mark Perry, the, the creator of a famous punk zine called Sniffing Glue, that said, "Yeah, the clash." The, no, what was it? Yeah, the pistol was would make you yeah want to smash your head against the wall, but the clash would give it give you a reason. Mm -hmm. That was it. I mean, simple as that. Is a you know the pistol sort of lit the um, touch paper that set the whole thing off, but they imploded so quickly, and it was the clash that gave punk depth and gravity and any kind of longevity you know what I mean? really filled it out for it to become you know this thing that we keep talking about today yeah it was it, it was a much more a much more sort of thoughtful and almost serene for, form of punk which sound which sounds sounds contradictory but of course you know you, you make the case it's it's not at all look you you also there's also in, in the film you, you go over to Jamaica with Richard Branson and, and John Lydon after the the Sex Pistols split that must have been astonishing what do you remember about that oh man that trip to Jamaica was like the most, it's, it's the most mind blowing journey of my entire life. Malice in Gangeland. You've got to understand, I'd never been to the island. Mm. Um, you know, the closest I'd ever been was seeing this film, A Harder They Come. And as you so rightly pointed out, I was invited by John to escape the kind of implosion of the um, pistols and help Richard Branson start a reggae label. You know, cut to, you know, me sitting by the pool in Kingston, Jamaica, and it's like, you know, the jungle drums have gone out in you know, a rich white man signing up reggae <laughs> artists because for the next two weeks, everybody who was anybody except Bob Marley 
Bunny Whaler and Peter Tosh came to try and get a deal with Richard. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting by the pool and I'm seeing all these names that I've previously only seen on, you know, record labels, you know, all my childhood heroes. So, you know, I owe John big time for that, you know. Yeah. You, you, you also talk about while you're there, uh, track, tracking down your grandmother who you'd never met and wouldn't meet again. That's a, I mean, that's a, that's a, a really powerful memory. Yeah, it was a bit of a culture shock for me and her. Because I tell you what was weird is my, my grandmother, obviously of another generation, and that was the generation that was brought up under English rule. And in the wake of Jamaica's independence, Jamaica had gone through such radical change. I've got to say, facilitated by the music, that even my grandparents were kind of somewhat removed from the, the, the Jamaica of, well, the then, today, if you know what I mean. So to see their son turn up from England with dreadlocks, which back then was a kind of a no-no, mm -hmm. you know, it was only with the advent of Bob Marley that that turned around. You know, we both looked at each other and it's almost like this weird standoff. Yeah, she couldn't relate to me, I couldn't relate to her. And to be quite honest with you, I shamefully sort of said, look, Grandma, I'll check you later because I could not deal with it. It was too real. Yeah, I mean, you can the the, the intensity of it very much does does come across. Um, look, you, I mean, the, 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 there's so much in the film we can't possibly cover all of it. But you you know, you spend you spend a lot of time in London. Obviously, you also go to go to go to New York. Do you see anywhere in the world now that has a similar sort of sort of cultural energy, that sort of vibrant buzz to sort of seventies punk London or or eighties hip hop New York? I mean, the world's changed so much, facilitated by technology in the digital age, that those kind of style-driven subcultures, I think, are a thing of the past. And, you know, maybe for young, you know, it's tough out there for young people, man. You know, maybe it's better that they get their heads together than their hair do. So I don't think we'll see, see those style-driven subcultures so much. But it would be naive to say that that unification of like-minded people to create something that the mainstream doesn't fulfill you know, that's sort of a hope. It's timeless. I just hope mm. it's got a good soundtrack, man. So, I mean, look, yeah, look, a, a lot of your, I mean, I, a lot of your, 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 your legacy, I guess, will be to, to do with pioneering music videos. You know, you made, you made so many. You made, you know, L L London Calling, Rock the Casbah, uh, Past the Duchy, and uh, and and so on. What, um, I mean, what would you say is, what? It's, it's a strange, it's maybe too obvious a question, but what's what's your favorite? What, what's your favorite video of the ones you've made? What do you think is your most iconic music video? Oh, man, that's really hard. I mean, you know, people would say London Calling, but I'd beg to differ. It's probably um, musical use past the duchy mm -hmm. because that did for my generation, that is black and British, the same thing it did, the same thing that Millie's hit, my, sm my, boy, my boy Lollipop, did for my parents' generation. It gave them a sense of pride. It kind of galvanised them and sort of said, we're, we're here. And it actually took a long time for being black and British to mean something. And past the duchy, which came out in what was it, 1982, was the beginning mm. of that thing beginning to actually come together and actually not solidify until the late 80s with the advent of bands like Soul to Soul. Sure. Yeah. No. They, I mean, I, I see exactly what you mean. The sort of the, the 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 birth of a sort of real real identity there. Look, Don Letts, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, fascinating to speak to you. I wish I could speak to you longer. But Rebel Dread is out in cinemas and out on digital this Friday, the fourth of March. Thank you very much indeed, Don Letts. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. I was going to say, yeah. gonna say if you can't make the film, my book's out there as well. There and black again. Well, yes, absolutely. Then, why not? Why not do both? Thank you very much, Don Letts. Mm -hmm.